Hi, I'm your host, Peter Sachuk. I'm a professor of adult education and workplace learning at the University of Toronto. On this episode of Work, Learning, and Social Change, Emerging Voices, we hear from Sheldon Bromfield. He's a doctor researcher doing uh, work on changes in not-for-profit employment services, subjectivity, and the labor process. I'm extremely pleased uh, to bring uh, what will hopefully be the first in a series of kind of, you know, fairly informal discussions to you out there uh, on advanced work and learning theory and research. And uh, the, the difference, I think, with this series, this being the first one in the series, uh, is that it focuses on cutting edge work of up and coming researchers, researchers that I feel, you know, in all my heart that are going to... Uh, you know, basically be, you know, voices in the, in the, our body of research and working on studies for, for years to come. Anyways, while we're going to deal with, in each of our, our, our sets of discussions, everybody out there, um, while we're going to be dealing with the specifics of, a, of our guests' research, I think what we're going to try to weave into it or what will come clear is that it also speaks equally clear to some overarching lessons on work and learning research. And in this case, with special attention to the kind of foundational work of Harry Braverman and what's become what's become known as the labor process theory tradition. Uh, so that's a bit of an opening, everybody. Um, and now I want to introduce our guest. And the guest today is someone I know really well, known for a number of years, worked together. That'll come out maybe a bit as we talk, but as a formal introduction, uh, our, our guest is, is Sheldon Bromfield. Sheldon's a PhD student at the University of Toronto located in the uh, Ontario Institute for Studies and Education, Adult Education Community Development Program. And he specializes in workplace learning as a, a minor, or what UAT is called a specialization in workplace learning and social change. And I'm so pleased because Sheldon, well, he's probably more pleased than I am, but Sheldon is in his final, very final phase of his PhD journey. Uh, and uh, he, we're actually getting uh, right on the, the, the eve or getting close to the eve of his final oral defense. Uh, so um, that's very uh, exciting for both of us, but more so him than me, I'm sure. Uh, anyways, his thesis, as you're going to learn a little bit more about today, draws on labor process theory that I just mentioned. Only he draws on it from a, a specific stream or, or tradition, uh, which focuses on Foucauldian governmentality. Um, and so with this, he, he kind of explores, as he'll explain a little bit more, the tensions and contradictions with a focus on not-for-profit organizations, work organizations. In this case, uh, uh, work organizations dealing with employment services. Anyways, I actually have cobbled together a long list of uh, accolades from Sheldon. I don't know if I want to take time to read them all, but he's a, he's a multiple award winner. He holds a SHRC, uh, Social Science and Humanities Research Council Canada Doctor Award. He holds uh, what's called the Jack Quarter Prize in Social Economy has a foot in that world. He holds multiple Ontario graduate uh, uh, scholarships, uh, which are very competitive as well. Uh, and he also is, uh, was a close runner up for the best uh, uh, student paper award in an international uh, conference series called Researching Work and Learning. So I'm just super pleased to sit down and talk with him. It's uh, too long of an introduction, I'm sure. Uh, so I'm just gonna get right to my first question. But first I'll say, thanks Sheldon for taking the time to talk with me. And yeah, thanks for having me, Peter. It's okay. my pleasure. Great. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to read a little bit of this, this note here I have for myself. So this is a, my first question. I, we're going to hear from Sheldon on, okay? So Sheldon, can you tell me a little bit about your PhD thesis specifically? And it's entitled, I have written down here, Connected Yet Disconnected, with a subtitle, New Public Management and Labor Ex Expropriation Within Public Employment Services mm -hmm. Work. And, uh, you know, if you can, tell us a little bit also about your, yourself and your research background and how you arrived at this focus in your uh, doctoral thesis. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Over yeah. to you. Sure, sure. Um, so I'll start with uh, the background, my background. And um, I'll give you a little bit of my work and uh, work experience and um, go delve more deeply into my educational background. So... I started out in education in uh, management studies and accounting in my undergrad and then moved into business administration in an MBA and then, you know, working with um, pre predominantly government and not-for-profit uh, agencies, uh, I found that 
my values and what I've learned in 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 my educational journey was um, not really meshing in terms of I, I couldn't even use much of what I learned in business administration and accounting and so on in the roles that I had in these organizations, and so you know although. I've never worked for a for-profit entity. I've always been with either government or not-for-profit. I've always thought that the tensions and the, the struggles of the organizations, whether in a for-profit or not-for-profit government kind of workplace, are similar. Um, they both, both operate within the capitalist uh, framework. And so if you're in government or not-for-profit, you'll find that you will struggle with managing budgets, cost cutting. Uh, there's this mantra of doing more with less. And I'm sure there are similar issues that happen in a for-profit company, as well as they strive to make profit um, and maximize wealth. So in, in, in just thinking about this question, I, I think about Braverman and I think about what he said about his uh, main detractors that he would, would have expected based on the, his, his work. Uh, he said that, you know, these persons uh, would float in the stream of conventional social sciences. And I guess I was floating for some time in the stream of conven conventional social sciences with business and management and accounting and so on. But then I decided, hey, you know what, I need to continue my, my educational journey. I need to um, also look at other career options as well. And I decided to pursue education at, um, at OEZ in the Adult Ed and Community Development Program with the Workplace Learning and Social Change Collaborative. And that was what really got my attention when I researched that program. I, I really just fell in love with that, that, that collaborative specialization in workplace learning and social change. And so um, when I started that MED, uh, I was very much uh, taken up with the concept of neoliberalism and that carried on into my PhD, which I began two years after in about in 2017, after I completed my MED. And um, I knew when I started my PhD that I would be doing something with neoliberalism and based on my experience with working with government or not-for-profits. Um, but I wasn't sure. I just had a vague, just a vague idea. And then neoliberalism is such a, such a, such a, such a wide area um, that it, it wouldn't be conducive to just focus on, on, on the neoliberal issues within our, within our workplace, not-for-profit or government. So in doing uh, advanced this course, advanced studies in workplace learning and social change. Uh, light bulb came on when I, you know, we got to the topic of again, labor process theory and Harry Braverman, and I latched on to this theoretical concept um, uh, called labor process theory, and we'll be calling it LPT uh, as we move forward. And so LPT actually is well suited for looking at the tensions within workplaces, um, specifically on the sh at the shop level, those micro issues of wage and um, labor time and, and, and uh, the value of labor and so on, because it's really rooted in Marxist labor theory of value. And so um, what even was more fascinating to me was that LPT had evolved over the years from Braverman's classic introduction uh, that he took on, uh, from Marx. And many other scholars came in um, in waves and, and, and started to research labor process theory and actually augment the theory, expand it and improve upon it. Uh, and so what happened was that in about the third or fourth wave, re instead of researchers, uh, came in uh, the Foucauldians. Uh, so, and so the Foucauldian researchers actually, their contention was that Braverman only focused on this tension between work, uh, worker and, um, 
labor 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 capital um, labor capital and and capital itself, but not so much the other issues uh, such as the social relations within the workplace, the the power relations, and the organizational structure itself. And that was what I said. Ah, this is it. This is it. Foucauldian LPT is such an appropriate theory to use to look at not-for-profit or government workers because they work within the confines of this the this capitalist system they belong to it but they don't belong to it so much because they are not striving to maximize wealth for anybody really and and so but they struggle with the same kind of issues within the capitalist framework and that is really connected to what Foucault later studied uh, in neoliberal governmentality he's the one who is credited as coining that uh, term neoliberal governmentality and that that is what uh, connects into you now the overarching apparatus through which government now tries to control and manage uh, the way um, people act and and go about uh, uh, actually problem solving their own issues and and working hard and so on and so that led me now to think about okay all right now i have the theoretical framework i have a, a set of workers i want to look at i want to look at that uh, you know not for profit or and government type workers but then that is still too broad for a phd project you and i spoke a little bit about that oh you need to and i remember you said to me uh you need to find a cluster of workers uh to focus on so you know struggled a little bit and i spoke with some colleagues, former colleagues from my not-for-profit um, work. And one particular uh, friend of mine said, hey, why don't you research Employment Ontario? It's a public employment service funded by the government of Ontario. And there are issues there that needed a story. The story needs to be told, she said. And I said, OK, I don't know much about Employment Ontario, um, EO. Uh, and I said that the little that I, re I remember thinking, I, I know a little bit about it because in in one of my not-for-profit roles, I, I worked with um, high school youth. And those youth uh, would need summer jobs, you know, as, as young people. The young people want to get summer jobs in high school. And so I had interfaced with a few colleagues from that organization that I was with in that role who were EO staff. And they would ask me to come into my program with the young people and uh, try to recruit uh, youth participants for the summer jobs programs of employment, EO, Employment Ontario. So that's all I knew. But then through consultation with um, actual workers in EO and former workers, I uh, started to do a little bit of the preliminary investigations and um, in a sense, preliminary field work, in a sense. And I learned a little bit more about EO and some of the, the struggles and the EO transformation that's occurring right now. And that was the birth of the PhD proposal to research employment Ontario um, from the workers' perspective, not from the clans' perspectives, really, but from those who are the practitioners, the specialists, the people who do the work, deliver the program to the job seeker clients or the service users as some may call them. And so um, what my thesis is really about is the impact of neoliberal issues that come through um, the Employment Ontario program to control manage the way these workers actually deliver the program and the way in which these job seekers are molded to become job ready and self-efficient self efficient and uh, self-reliant to get their own jobs and, and I guess, get off of employment um, benefits and, and, and so on. So um, what happens is that these workers are doing the work of the, they're doing good work, right? Good is good, good work. It's important. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's it's really sincere work. And the issue is that they are, they are doing the work of the public sector. 
but they are not treated as public sector workers. They're not treated commensurate like public sector workers, right? Um, they are really, they are really not for profit workers because they work in that sector, but they deliver the program, the Employment Ontario program for the government. And so there are many issues there. There are many issues there because they can't deliver the program how they see fit. Uh, they, they deliver the program based on the constraints of the government funding and the, the structure of the EO program, um, which deals with austerity policies, as we all know, there's a ne- neoliberal issue. Right, so that's what the, all of that just ties in very nicely um, that came from uh, this course in advanced studies in workplace learning and, and Foucauldian LPT. And uh, just to finally wrap up the answer to this question, uh, I haven't mentioned it, but the title has new public management in it. And that's the key because how what, what I see is that new public management now is the mechanism through which government controls the work that these workers do, right? So new public management is the influence of business-like practices within public administration on service delivery. And that is worked out within the program guidelines, the targets, the funding structure, and everything else. And and so, uh, yeah, all of that ties nicely into a a bridging of the macro into the micro. Um, Yeah. Well, thanks. That gives uh, me a better sense of of the work. And then then, uh, the audience now will know about it. But you know, like um, uh, now when you you mentioned these different waves, um, and and I think that's very important for people to understand that there's this you know these kind of uh, kind of key figures and, and Braverman I mentioned as well. Uh, I don't know if we call that the first wave, probably. Eh? And then you mentioned the Foucauldians. Now, when you mentioned the Foucauldian wave of this kind of work analysis, you're talking about people like David, David, David Knight, nice. Will, 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 yeah. Yeah, and he, Hugh Wilmot. Yeah, Wilmot. Okay. I think I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. So nights. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that that process uh, continues on. That like really, in in a way, would you say, like, you know, there's a way of thinking about these waves in in labor process theory as you know, there's one wave and then it gets kind of demolished and then there's a new wave. But I've always wondered. I, I'd be interested in your view on this. Like. Can all the waves kind of continue to uh, roll at the same time, or does is like is Braverman done basically, or does do some people? I can think of a few that, in my opinion, are still working in a kind of almost a Braverman tradition, almost a first wave uh, yes. on on contemporary issues. So, like, uh, are the first and second waves irrelevant, or I don't, you know, what, what's your view on that? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. Um, I don't think they are totally irrelevant. The first and second wave, those hardcore de- defenders of Braverman, his classic de-skilling thesis, uh, they because de-skilling still occurs in some shape or fashion in today. We can find it if we look hard, look closely enough at the different types of labor processes and the different types of workspaces uh, that we have. No, which is multivariate. There are so many different types of work, uh, paid labor that, that happens in today's uh, economy. You can use any, I think, any one of them, any one of those waves to attack the problem that you're, 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 you're trying to research. Uh, it just depends on what the problem is. Uh, for me, the problem was uh, these not-for-profit workers doing the work of the government but not being treated the same as uh, government workers and not having the freedom to uh, actually conceptualize the program and deliver the program in the way they would want. You know, so there are, are issues that stem from neoliberal governance that tie deeply into what is going on on the shop floor. Uh, but it really depends. I know, I know that uh, staunch defenders of Braverman have been critiqued for almost gatekeeping labor process theory and not allowing it to advance at a r- more rapid pace than it should it should should be um, i remember even reading an, an article that i think um michael Bur- Bur- Boy, um, or Burway, 
uh, wrote where he said that Braverman was a classic of its time, mm. that it's, it's, it was relevant for the times in which we had a plethora of factory workers and craft skills, because Braverman is very, very interested in uh, talking about craft skills and the, the de-skinning through the separation of execution and conceptualization of work within crafts, craft work, you know, skills work, a factory, factory label. Um, so <laughs> the thing is, even in my thesis, I, I argue that EO is, is, is a type of factory work. There's, it's a relic. There are relics of, of, of factory type work. It's not, it's not a factory um, at all, but Braverman's classic analysis of the factory comes in in the way I remember one, for example, one of my interviewees said, it's like we're, we're producing these, these uh, workers, producing employable people in, 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 in a cookie cutter kind of uh, like widgets, right? And I never forgot that phrase. It's like we're making widgets. Mm. And, and I said, oh, yeah. So she, you know, she, she's alluding to a kind of factory kind of way in this kind of robotic, mechanized way of producing human beings to become employable, right? Right. And what does that really mean? It's, 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 it's very subjective, right? In who is really employable versus who is unemployable, um, right? So I would say it depends. It really depends on what the problem you are looking at. You can use any one of the streams, the, the waves um, to attack the problem. Well, it, I think that's really sound advice. The idea of, uh, you know, picking the wrong tool uh, when you're presented with a job that doesn't require it or, or it doesn't fit the job uh, that you're trying to, you know, I, I can bring a, well, I, 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 you know me, I'm full of metaphors. Some of them work, some of them don't. But sometimes a pen is a great tool to have, but not when you're trying to nail in a nail in a piece of wood. You know, so exactly. the tool yeah, and, that's the, a good one. And, the, and the task. Yeah. Uh, no, I yes. think it's a good point you're making there um this question um uh i had another question in mind but i want to just pick up with what you've kind of already started to lay out here now the the governmentality tradition in 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 in, in labor process theory uh research it does something that arguably is unique though especially in comparison to braverman uh around the idea of taking you know the subjectivity of the person into account. This whole, I guess, notion, I think you would agree with me that, you know, you know, workers do the work, but work can also do work on the worker. It the design of right. work changes the whole. Yeah, can you just speak a little bit? Was there evidence that you found in your research around this kind of element of the identity or subjectivity of the worker being changed by the, what well, Braverman might uh, just analyze as a, as a labor process design, scientific right. management even? Uh, yes. but, but it's changing the subject. To, did, did your research speak to that much? Or? Yes, yes, yes. I'm glad you asked that. So, so uh, if, I, if, I, if I had, uh, you know, st st stuck too close to classic Braverman, I would have missed that point because Braverman does not go into the issues of subjectivity and, and the worker's response to the, to the issue of this killing, for instance. Uh, so... What I've found in my research that, uh, just as you said, the, 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 the workers are influencing the work and the work is influencing them, shaping it. So they are shaping the work and, and it is shaping their response to it as well. And, and what I found is that the workers struggle with how to meet the targets set by the ministry that uh, manages the EO funding and the program um, structure itself. And some of them say the targets are unfair, unreasonable. And some of them would say that they would have to find ways to what I call strategically navigate to actually bend or break the rules of the program in order to meet the targets that are set up by the ministry. So that's the subjectivity of the worker. Mm -hmm. The issue of worker identity now becomes a problem because... The worker um, in, in, in EO is typically someone who wants to do what is right by the person they are serving, not necessarily rush them through the program to go and just get any job 
that any and any job that becomes available. Um, but they 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 want to build relationships with the, with the people they serve and actually find meaningful employment. But that is very difficult to attain based on the the the, the research that I've done and what I've discovered. It's very difficult to attain that kind of outcome within the Employment Ontario, the EO program. So their, their subjectivity comes in in terms of the issues, in terms of how they see themselves, their, their occupational identity, how they would prefer to do the work, how, the, you know, how they see themselves really as care workers, um, how they lack control over the targets themselves, how they lack control. They have some amount of leeway to design the program delivery the way they want, but the government still has some program guidelines that they have to, st st to stick to, right? So they are, they are, they are for instance, um, uh, Employment Ontario has a, a training and education, uh, kind of job training and education, uh, like a, a, an area of focus there, but it cannot be more than 10% of your clientele that engages in that area. And then some of the, the interviewees spoke about the fact that the 10% is too small, that many people need to advance their, their training and education in order to get better jobs, in the, become you know, more marketable in the labor market. Mm -hmm. And the program restricts them from doing that. So they have, they have some amount of affordance and control and leeway um, to bend the rules, uh, to... to to, to cheat a little or as one, one, one of my interviews said, doing the dance, she needs to do the dance. Another interviewer said um, she needs to finesse the system sometimes, work the system, find workarounds. Uh, and some of them just resist, resist to, to, to really uh, do anything but just quickly try and get people jobs. They are there to just get people jobs and they'll quickly just find, try and get people employment whatever it is, and persuade their clients to take whatever job comes available, right? They're, they're going to conform rather, or, you know, in some cases resist being a care worker. Yeah. So, I mean, the type of analysis that your work's generated, then it's, I think what you're describing is that beneath the surface, what appears like this is how, uh, I guess, employment Ontario, the, the service is designed to run. This is the design of the work. But underneath the surface, beneath the surface where you can't always see, there's actually multiple identities of workers who yes. are making choices and all this kind of stuff in terms of how they, and which then tumbles forward, I guess, uh, in terms of they have to learn these identities, they have to learn the skills to act on that identity. So there's all this learning that supports it's all the scaffolding of identity. Is that something that is kind of, that's a little bit of what, am I understanding the basic yes. analysis now? Yes, it is. So, so, so what, I, what I thought about is that they are largely not able to deliver the program how it ought to be delivered, but instead they learn to cope with the ways of delivering the program to meet the targets of the program. So it becomes a numbers game, a targets kind of game that dictates their behavior and how they actually treat clients and to get the outcomes that they need to get to please the ministry. Uh, so yes, there is that. And, and the different workers respond in different ways. Of course, everyone is not doing the same thing. They find their own ways in, 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 in how they respond. And, that, and this is where definitely the Foucauldians um, bring something really meaningful to labor process theory is that as David Knights argued, I, I believe he said, braver man is too preoccupied with the worker and the task and not he does not spend enough time on the social relations of the work and the power relations of the organization and the organizational structure affecting the worker and how the worker responds and affects the structure right so um I paraphrase a bit with, with David Knights there, but essentially that's what he's saying. And so I found that my research teased those elements out uh, much more. 
right, than the classic Braver Man reskilling pieces. Right. And now having, when you laid that all out for us there, like I, I'm now seeing a little bit of how you um, drew on this third, we'll call it the third wave of coding traditions, uh, in part because the task at hand was this being confronted with new management. You mentioned that earlier. Uh, you know, it's so funny, new management, that the term's been around right. for so long. It's too bad that someone had to call it new back when. But anyway, so we still use the yeah. term. Yeah, I understand why. Um, uh, but I, it made me think about the Foucaultian tradition as you're applying it is solving this delicate dance between having a serious theorization analysis of work and then all at the same time married uh, and including a serious analysis of personhood and identity and subjectivity and 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 then essence learning uh, because that's all the you know the nuts and bolts of that identity formation and choice making and everything else and I just right. I, 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 I've kind of just paraphrased what you just said but it just made me um, realize that I kind of was on a similar track. I have been for, for a long time now in tr always trying to find that uh, really robust analysis of work that marries with a, a theory of, of personhood and change and becoming and all these kind of learning more content, learning concepts. And I solved it in a different way than you, but I, I'm learning a lot from, from the way you've solved essentially the same problem I did or, or been, I've been trying to solve, but using a different set of memory set tools, different set of tools. And right. Sometimes my work, my mine work, and sometimes and sometimes they don't. And then I think I need to look in your toolkit. Um, thank mm -hmm. you very much. I want to. Uh, we've covered so much ground here. Um, I want to jump to one of my later questions here. Is and you've kind of covered this, but if you could summarize your maybe let's say give a couple key takeaways, either for new researchers or for you know experienced people uh, working in research and work and learning in the field. If you could give one, two, maybe three, but two, two key takeaways from your from your recent, I think it's very cutting edge, and maybe your idea of what uh, what those cutting edge contributions are are a little different than mine. But what would you say your two key takeaways are from your thesis research? Right. So, so from the research itself, the, the actual field work, I would say. Um, Experienced researchers, I'm sure, would know what I'm about to say, but I think for, for us as students uh, coming in new, PhD students, especially new to research as I was, I, I, a bit of a novice, so to speak, um, what I found that was um, key was to be very open, to be open to surprises. Because um, we tend to research areas that we are passionate about which means that we resonate with something, that, an, an, an issue um, in a work, we'll be talking about workplace and uh, workplace learning here, um, within the workplace and learning, which in a sense, we all partake in. This is a very human, human, human thing in terms of work and, and, and learning. It's part of our human condition. And so we will have our organic thoughts, our unconscious biases, our implicit way of thinking about the field in which we're interested in. And I had those, although I didn't know a, 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 a great detail of employment in Ontario. I, I worked in not-for-profit and I kind of knew what my struggles were. <laughs> and so uh, I thought that de-skilling was one of the things, Braver Man 101 <laughs> classic, would come to the forefront in some way um, because de-skilling is really the separation of the execution and the conception of, of conceptualization of work, which I spoke about before. But the predominant issues, as I mentioned earlier, that came were issues of identity, issues of um, strategic navigation in terms of how to deliver the program, issues of lack of resources, a lack of control over the work design to a certain extent, and um, just a way in which the workers respond to carve out the, their, whole, uh, their whole view of what employment service, employment Ontario service delivery should be, should be. And I found that, that so the subjectivity of the worker came more to the forefront than the skilling thesis. It was there, but not, not in a very strong way uh, to be represented in the uh, PhD thesis itself. So I would say, be open to whatever surprises 
um, uh, could take place in, 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 in the field. And preliminary field work, I mentioned that earlier, and I found it in my method, methods chapter, I discussed the preliminary field work that I did. And uh, it's so helpful. It's so helpful to, although you may have experience in the field, you may even work in the field presently, speak to colleagues, speak to people who used to work in the field. As I found I had in my, I did 32, over 32 interviews, but with 32 different participants, individual participants. And around 40% of them had recently moved on from the, from the, from the sector from Employment Ontario. And I found that they were very can more candid. They were, yeah, I guess because they don't work in the field anymore. They're not, they're, they don't, they're not intimidated by anything. And so they were free to really explain what was happening in, in the field. And some of them even rant and raved about some of the, the issues they faced. And, and so when you have that kind of preliminary work and talking to all kinds of people who have experience within and who have had experience within the field. You can have key informants that guide the research design, guide the questions, guide many of the, the, the ways in which you will conduct the research. And life can be a little bit more easier in the field with, with those kinds of um, participants. And I use that semi semi-structured interview style. Another thing I would say is that with the semi-structured interview style, I believe it, it, it frees you up to kind of adapt and change the questions with the interviewees. So I found that at first, my set of, first set of questions that I, were, that I was asking the interviewees uh, weren't, could not be uh, transitioned across all the interviewees because some of them had different roles within Employment Ontario and a question to a job developer would that may be very pertinent would not apply to for example an employment counselor which is another role within the uh, program so be 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 open to change things up as you move through your research um, I would say those are my takeaways well yeah. that's one of the most that's a beautifully put takeaway. That business about, I like how you said it. You gotta be open to surprises. What the right. what the heck are we in this for? If we're not actually gonna be surprised by something, well, we know it all already. So I, I but right. but I think I think it's it's still too novel to people's uh, to many researchers' uh, work. Right. Yeah. 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 Because I think we 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 uh we may think we know what exists and and what we are going to find i think it's just human to uh, to anticipate anticipate findings although we should you know we shouldn't really stick to that as a researcher but you have to manage that aspect of yeah. of your biases yeah really nicely put really nicely put well i want to ask you just a final question which is what's next for your research are you going to just start some whole new topic area are you going to pick up some pieces that you've already been developing where do you want to go in the future with your research you know around work and learning hopefully hopefully you'll stay in the field that i work in and you'll keep you know contributing that way but what, what do you have in mind what comes next yeah that's a very timely question because i'm i'm definitely um trying to forecast which i'm going to work that out, work through that right now yeah, so definitely I'm uh, very passionate about work and learning. And um, I, I remember a colleague of mine called me the workplace guy. <laughs> right, so I want I wanted to stick within, uh, within, within that field. And then public employment services uh, is a very under-researched area in Canada, especially employment Ontario. And um, my research only skimmed the the issues within employment Ontario and public employment services in Canada, and so there are many other issues that the data actually kind of hinted towards, but but never provided enough to write about in certain aspects. And so um, things like uh, issues relating to race, issues relating to gender, issues relating to um, to age and class as well. And so uh, public employment services, uh, programs like Employment Ontario, uh, I would say they reproduce low wage labor. 
So there is definitely a class issue. And just going back to Braver Man, Braver Man, I believe in his introductory chapter, said that this is a book for the working class, which is a class in itself, not a class for itself. And the thing is, his contention was also issues with class, work and class. And employment on terror, public employment services, linked to employment and then employment links to social class as well. So I think that's something that, uh, a topic that's not, for, to me, I, I, I could be wrong in my, my knowledge so far, but to me, from what to the best of my knowledge, I think class and work and learning is not uh, talked about enough within um, work and learning uh, research. So that's something that could be, could be delved into. Um, I'm also interested in looking deeper at the thesis and the data collected so I could carve up the data and the thesis, see if I could write, write um, articles from it. The thesis could be transitioned into, into, into a, a book publication as well. I have in fact co-authored a, 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 a paper with um, a colleague who is, is doing her, her PhD as well in adult ed. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's focused on employment Ontario, uh, which is interesting. And uh, she is more focused on the job training and education side and on the, 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 a program called Second Career, which is one of the, the educational training, job training programs of employment Ontario. But we wrote a paper that focuses on worker bur- burnout. Oh, how these programs like Employment Ontario can contribute to worker burnout Um, because there's compassion, satisfaction and compassion fatigue that is experienced in serving in these programs. So my thesis alludes a little bit to that, but for further um, expansion on on that area, that's that's a paper paper to to focus on. So that paper is with a journal for review right now. And um, I also have survey data that I did not use in the thesis. So that's another, that's some quantitative data I could look into and see how I could get something for publication there. And um, just to finally add, I also wrote a solo, solo article entitled Worker Agency Versus Wellbeing in the Enforced Work From Home Arrangement During COVID-19, a labor process analysis. So that is with a journal also for review. Looking forward to the publication of that one as well. That's beautiful. Wow. I mean, it couldn't be more timely, obviously. But COVID as a feature of the labor process, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Now, can I ask you, just because I have you on the spot here, is there materials that you could uh, share with me, maybe even pre-publication that maybe uh, students or other people might be interested? Anyways. We'll talk after this interview. Um, if there are things that you can share, I can uh, kind of connect it with this uh, with this discussion we're having, and uh, yeah. then people can read up on a background. And at the very least, we can do a link uh, uh, as soon as you graduate, happening anytime. We can put a link to people can download your thesis and look at it itself. Great. Yeah, yeah that sounds that sounds great. That sounds perfect. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna forward. stop stop for now and uh i really appreciate you taking the time to tell us about this i think just the details and the specifics of your project can almost teach us more about the field sometimes of labor process theory when people see the details of application rather than just reading theory 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 you know and so i think it, it, it certainly is a nice compliment to uh understanding the labor process theory in terms of and how it applies to workplace learning, social uh, and social change. Uh, so I want to yeah. thank you. Uh, and this will just conclude. And uh, I look forward to connecting at some uh, later date. And we'll uh, yeah. chat about other stuff. Yeah, thanks for having me, Peter. It was, was a pleasure. Oh, yeah. great. Well, All right. we'll talk to you take soon. Care. And uh, talk to you soon. take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.